Hi, and welcome to this uh, great session. Um, I've been coming here for years, and I every year do a very typical presentation where, as a lawyer, I make you go through all the nuances of uh, franchising and, uh, and the elements involved. And uh, I decided to do a departure from that practice because the last few years of my life I've discovered that, you know, it's easier to take a hat of simplicity rather than to take a legal uh, hat when it comes to interacting with clients. Um, so what I'm going to do is that uh, uh, this session I'm going to make highly interactive. I will uh, take you through an actual process right from the time that you walk into the gate. So let's assume that you are entering Pragati Madan and uh, you informed that you know a huge uh, franchise seminar is happening here. You come in as a prospective person who wants to tie up with some brand either as a franchisor or a franchisee. You find a huge selection of options before you. Uh, you narrow down one particular option and you take a, a, initially a gut call on what business you want to explore and then you get into the process of a more uh, process-oriented thinking in terms of what is to be done. So the idea of my session is that I want to make you participate rather than just uh, the three of us participating and in the course of our discussions I will of course get uh, our uh, experts to give you a a bit of advice and a bit of presentation with, on what they wish to share with you. But let's start off by this very simple thought process that you've narrowed down a business and you're, you haven't done anything beyond identification of a business. What, according to you, would you do as uh, the next steps? So what would you do once you've narrowed down, identified a business? Whether you're a franchise or a franchisee. So you will form a company. Okay, I'll make notes. So you'll form a company, enter into a franchise agreement. Any others? So protect a brand. Hire a lawyer. See, the first thing you would start off by doing is the partner search. I think the biggest thing that the differentiation between a good business and a not so good business, I'm not necessarily going to qualify as a bad business, is also the credibility of the parties that transact the business. And usually uh, a partner search is not just a, uh, you know, you have uh, an intuition when you meet people, you like them, you sort of dine with somebody and you feel good about it, but you still have to do a little bit of a diligence. And the reason why you need to do a diligence is you have to look at the future. You don't have to look at the business today, you have to look at future. Are there difficulties? What is the level of adjustment that will happen? Uh, what happens when there's uh, ongoing creativity in a business process? How will the two businesses react to that? Does somebody have the ability to pay you royalties up front? Does somebody have the ability to sustain royalties? Is the vision of the partner aligned towards, uh, for example, collection of royalties? Or is it inclined more towards a larger issue? Uh, I, I'm sure many of you know this, and it's a, a lot of my past presentations have touched upon this. But uh, there are two examples of wealth creation in India, which is a company called Page Apparels, uh, which is a franchisee of Jockey, and a company called Jubilant, which is a franchisee of Domino's Pizza, PMC, INC. And you know the market capitalizations have soared. So the question is that you have to, when you do a diligence, you basically have to put down what your thought process is and what is the thought process of your partner and how they align together. And once you've got that ready, the substance of the rest of the process will start, which means the second element of entering into a contract. So you'll exactly know what is it that you want to negotiate in the contract. Now, if I basically make a presentation to you and I show you the several clauses that are involved in the franchise agreement, they're less relevant because that would mean my asserting to you that these are these 20 things that every franchise agreement should have, exclusivity, non-exclusivity, jurisdiction, tenure, termination clauses, rights, obligation, etc., etc. But in real uh, terms, you haven't even told me what is your mindset, and I, neither do I know the mindset of a partner. And a good business will work not so much to do with just the agreement, but with the fact that there is a matching of minds. The second level of what you need to do is the identification of what is going to be your core strength. Why have you entered that business? Now, according to the several books that we read on strategy and when we deploy it in our own profession, when we consult for companies, is that uh, you cannot have a business that does not differentiate. We are in a world today where post-globalization, there are disruptive forces in place 
businesses, all of a sudden a brick and mortar business gets threatened by e-commerce, all of a sudden a car business gets threatened by a rental of, uh, of uh, car services, and many such things that keep happening. So you, you have to first sit down and narrow down all the thought processes and say, what is it that according to you will differentiate? So like uh, one of our colleagues here said, that you could identify brand as a differentiating element. Usually a franchise will come with a cluster of rights. Now what, according to you, would be the several cluster of rights? Because it's not a license deal. In a license deal, you'll have a brand, you pay royalty, you use the brand, and you produce, and you're good enough. But in a franchise, it's a bigger concept. So what, according to you, are the several things that come in a franchise? So I'm asking you, rather than telling you, because by your answers, you would be educating yourself far better than my sort of imposing it on you. So you've got a brand, you will identify some goods, because you have to use a brand on some goods. The goods may have some services, they may have a sort of a, uh, uh, after, after sales service, they may have a marketing angle, they may have a financing angle, so you'll identify that. You will typically have some literature, and the literature could come within the realm of copyright laws, as the brands could come under the realm of trademark laws. Then you will not be sure whether the brand is available or not available. There are certain businesses that have very high quality brands that are very distinctive and they have a global reputation and you're fine. But there are also emerging businesses that usually fall in the trap of adopting brands that are not very distinctive. For example, if I set up a food outlet and my brand itself uh, emanates from the origin of the food itself, you know, I'm pizza something. It's not so distinctive as opposed to, for example, Domino's, which has no significance. Domino's is only a game. Domino's had no significance to pizza, and they brought in brand equity in terms of the packaging, in terms of the trade dress, in terms of copyright, in terms of a domain name that they would protect, maybe for online uh, services, may, may, maybe only for education purposes, and the likes of all that. So after you've identified all your intellectual property, between you and the franchiser, you then have to take a call. Who will protect this? So who, according to you, should be protecting the IP? Hmm? Franchiser. Yeah, typically an IP should always be protected by the franchiser because it's a flow of rights coming from franchiser and it is also consistent to global ownership. And a lot of times uh, entrepreneurs fall for this trap. They do not get the protection done in the name of the franchiser. If at any point of time there's dispute between the parties or a termination, the franchiser will come and file a suit against you and say, but the brand is mine, I have documentation, I have emails, we've got minutes of meeting, etc. And your brand equity has come to an end. And you thought that you, it would have come to an end just because you protected it. But that protection itself means nothing because you know, it's coming from a preview of rights that, that has a different origin. So now the question also arises is, what if you innovate in the business? What if you come out with certain, re like for example, McDonald's came to India because some businesses have no transfer of technology, but certain businesses definitely include, particularly the music business, the, uh, 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 the digital printing business have a lot of technology transfer to you. There are elements of trade secrecy involved. India does not have a legislation currently on trade secrecy per se, but through a lot of other legislation, including Trademark Act, Patent Act, Design Act, Copyright Act, the Information and Technology Act, you would be able to protect all these things. And then there's a law of contract. You can put in disclosures there in your agreement in order to protect it. Uh, and then your questions of what will happen at country level domain names. For example, if you don't get the parent may have or the franchiser may have a .com, you may do a .in and then the question of protection of not just the domain name, but even the contents there, the privacy statements there, the ability of customers to log in there, the database that goes into a system. All this is part and parcel of your identification process. Now, once you've identified the IP and who will protect it, you enter into an agreement. So I will ask all of you and of course my co-panelists to share their wisdom with you on what typically should be in an agreement. So start identifying clauses. It's like a film. It's like a, you know, it's like reading a book. You have to start with a character and you introduce another character and then you bring a purpose and you, then you take it to a conclusion and you, then you think if the road turns left, what happens? If the road turns right, what happens? And that's how a good agreement is structured. A bad agreement is structured in a way you just come and tell me to make an agreement. I give you a template. You don't care. You just see the legal terminology. This got all laxin uh, 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 maxims into it and you like it and you, you, know, you think that because it sounds complex, it's good and you sign it. That doesn't make any sense. So what according to you could be the constituents of an agreement? And you can share your... 
to me the main consequence of a main contrib uh, contributors for an agreement should be that it should be far sighted it should be it should be in terms of the way the technology is developing in the day, way, day and age we are it should be far more contributing over a period of time that the agreement pertains say for the term and it should be that strong so in other words the very uh, uh, pertinent point that is being made here is that you should uh, in your assessment minimize the elements of friction and where does friction typically come into an agreement it could come in money that is for example down payment non payment regularity of payment tenure of payment it could come in territory you know you get a agreement for territory a you've got an agreement for example within a geographical location and just opposite the road there's another uh, franchisee who's entitled to do business the customer actually just has to cross the road or for example you're offline and there's a question of online online can reach even beyond india because somebody could just ask for shipment of products from india and the franchisee may say but that's legitimate i'm entitled to that business so things like territory money duration uh, uh, uh who would you go for relief would you go in for an arbitration would you go in for litigation who will have the right what happens when there is a violation of any right will it be an infringement action in a court will it be a passing of action or will it be a where both parties will decide or one party will decide and things of that magnitude and we'll share your wisdom on this my wisdom i'm not sure about that um <clears throat> fundamentally an agreement is there to lay out what you think you've you've the the deal that you've 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 created with your partner and when when i write agreements when i develop agreements i bear in mind two things the first and this is really important is that i don't plan to be working forever at one point or another i will either fall over dead or i'll retire and whoever comes after me needs to know what we agreed me and my partner back in the day because this this is going to be a successful agreement it'll go on it'll uh, continue past when I plan to be at Oxford and while I might have a perfect understanding with my partner my licensee and in, in my case and and you might have a perfect understanding with the franchise uh, franchise or, or license or that you're doing business with things change people move on and unless it's actually codified whether it's actually written down then you know things get lost and and relationships get damaged and the other point is that license agreements which is what i deal with not only deal with what will happen when things go right but they should also anticipate what will happen when things go wrong and in so many cases um license agreements fail and there's litigation and it's a horrible messy long drawn out expensive process asking courts to decide on things which actually should have been agreed in advance and and laid out in an agreement so um that's what agreements are for